you go deep into cold storage facilities and universities and data centers and hospitals and industrial facilities really behind the meter to find discretionary load to, to drive energy efficiency to help with energy management decision makings um, and and to provide that resource to grid operator utilities and so I think I think there's an overlap I mean more broadly to answer to your question, I think there's a really exciting convergence going on right now between energy and IT, information technology. Energy is one of the last domains where IT has really um, penetrated um, in terms of a, sm a smarter grid, um, giving consumers and utilities and all of us a better handle on our energy consumption in real time. Um, in the telecommunications world, you know, we can see in real time exactly how many minutes we've consumed on our cell phones, nights and weekends. There's a whole plethora of different pricing plans. It's a much more mature market. Whereas in energy, it's been something that, you know, there's been very little customer choice, very little customer service, very little innovation technology applied. It's been something that we manage, um, you know, we don't really manage. We manage passively. We get our utility days, 30 days after fact, utility bill, and we don't understand the line items. And so there's an amazing convergence going on right now to inform better energy decisions uh, across the board. Yes, uh, right over here in the corner, I think. We have a microphone coming to you right now. Yes. Hi, the question is for Christine. I'm just curious what kind of experiences or uh, challenges you had when dealing with the uh, U.S. Patent Office. Uh, what kind of uh, challenges? I have uh, great experience. We have actually, since we last spoke, we now have 138 patents, and I'm actually now on 80 of them. <laughs> uh, 42 are filed as uh, basically granted or allowed. So the challenges with the US Patent Office, I think, is that um, you've got to be very patient, and you have to have investors that are patient for the Patent Office to basically allow you granting. It takes longer. This is one of the hottest fields in the world, so that is true for all jurisdictions. We have a global patent portfolio, and we have used the process engineered to own the space. So we have patents that are describing the chemistry, the mechanical solutions, the electronics, and the systems, as well as the designs, and also actually the graphic interface, so we can interact with a new paradigm of how energy is going to be dispersed. I think the opportunity, though, in patents, and I want to really make sure you're aware, we have rather unique patent laws in the United States where you can file below radar, which is absolutely critical to a company like ours. So again, I compete with the giants in this industry every day. And in the U.S., you can file for 18 months, protect your idea, write it very precisely, and be under radar. I think that's pretty remarkable. And the thing that has changed in patent law globally is really the idea of 10 years ago, we used to patent everything we thought. Today, the patents need to be much more precise and much more insightful. So if you have that, you actually have protection. And um, I'm very, very pleased with how our patent portfolio has uh, developed. We own technology, and it is unchallenged. We have another question? Right over here. Right. A mic is right behind you. It will be there in a moment. Yes. Sir. Oh, hi. This question is for Christina. It's about batteries, proprietary and standard. Um, myself, my cell uses a proprietary battery, probably with, with my on, but it's very expensive to replace. And the same with my uh, cordless phone, my uh, programmable thermostat, and other battery devices at home use um, standard sized batteries, nickel metal hydride, rechargeable. What, um, what is your what are you doing about proprietary versus standard, and how do you see this in relation to your business model? Mm, that's a great question. So in order for this new energy paradigm to take off, we will see standardization, actually, because it lowers cost. Today, the paradigm is controlled by the paradigm of consumer electronics, where, you know, our cells goes into HP's computer as well as a, as a SUS tech. But you cannot take an HP battery today and put it into your Asus Tech computer, although it's our battery inside. And the handshake, which is really the secret sauce here, is kept by the laptop manufacturing uh, guys. And the reason 
for that is, of course, that they're afraid that you will either not use branded products or that you will actually have issues and then come back to haunt them. I think as we look at the new opportunity, um, you'll see that the boxes that come into your garage or outside your community with low energy storage coupled with clean tech and communicate it to the grid will have various sizes. So the standard, in my opinion, is not going to be in the battery, because frankly, we should optimize it around the energy consumption and basically the paradigm around the energy density. But the standard will come in the handshake. So you can have lots of different boxes, but handshake between the energy storage and the deployment application is really what needs to get standardized. And just take that to one more level. What happens? You have a real say. You become trader of energy. You can use and choose. That's pretty exciting. We have another question. Right in the front, a microphone will be right down to you in a moment. Oh, you have one back here too. I can't see back there, but if there's one way in the back, and then we'll come out front. Yes. Hi. Good morning. Um, my name is Mark Roberts, and um, this question is for Gail Goodman. I've been very successful in the music industry, entertainment industry, doing email. So twofold question. Um, how do I stay successful? Right now I'm working with Clearwire, and um, how do I translate that success with with a corporation such as Clear? And how do you stay competitive in, in addition to what we're doing with MailNet? When I, I am going to be um, uh, signing up for it, but how do you stay competitive with so much competition in, in what you do? So if I think the first First question was, I'm doing a great job on email marketing. How do you continue to get great value from that? Um, and I think um, if any of you out here aren't yet creating a customer list and using email to stay in touch with your customers, to connect to them, to come back into the business, um, you should be. And then I think what's the secret to that is staying relevant with who communicate. And giving value in your communication as opposed to just asking for value back. So if all of your email communications are about you, buy from me, right? come to my store, do this now for me, um, I think your email diminishes in value and people stop reading it. As consumers, we are amazingly good at filtering our email. Unbelievably good. Um, so for email marketing to be really effective, it needs to be informational versus promotional. And then that translates beautifully into social. So as you're sitting out there as a business owner thinking about, uh, you know, think about the questions your, your typical prospect asks when they walk into your business. Turning that into, you know, a great Facebook article using email to kick it off, right? Hey, you know, people are talking about challenges in managing their home power consumption, right? Here's great, you know, here are three thoughts from me. The email kicks off the dialogue, social continues the dialogue, and you become the hub of information or a source of advice and guidance for your customer base. That lets you really continue a dialogue with your customers when they're not in front of you. Keep them connected to your business. Of course, it makes you the person they refer others to who have similar questions and concerns. So I think for email, it's about keeping it relevant keeping it informational. How we stay competitive is really just about continuing to evolve our expertise and how to use these tools and giving freely of that expertise to our customers so that they stay uh, highly relevant well. I want to ask a similar question of Bert, and that is how do you stay in touch with your retailers, especially during these difficult times when they are experiencing such difficulty on the front lines? Yeah, many ways. I mean, uh, digital business is, we have more B2B than ever, and it's growing rapidly. And I think the key there that would really align with Gail's advice, whether it's a consumer or B2B, there's a pipeline, there's a digital pipeline. And if you are always selling, and it's always about what you have, and, and you're not listening to what they need, then you're doing what they call polluting the pipeline. And you can't, and businesses do it. We're all guilty of it. The less polluting of the pipeline you do, and the more clean you keep that pipeline, which means it's a two-way conversation, um, the better off it is. So I think we've, we've gotten adept at doing that and listen to our retailers. 
We've also put personnel in place for these different channels of distribution um, so that they have someone to go to and they can call and just get a recording. They can get somebody live who will drop what they're doing because they're a customer. So, it, it, again, that's an old-fashioned principle, but it's been lost because now we have automation, so people think that, uh, that they have the answer with something that bounces back to them or something that is a voicemail. By pressing no, number three, yes, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I, I think the last thing is that um, recently I was out at, um, in just outside of Las Vegas, why am I blank, oh, Zappos, <coughs> and I toured Zappos. And um, we got to a room that was filled with as many people as in this room. And what are they doing in here? He said, they're having dialogue with our customers. They're actually on the phone with consumers. So it may sound outdated to throw people um, you know, at a customer service, but that's one way they've done it. Their, their mantra is that they're powered by customer service. And if anybody has ordered shoes or anything else from Zappos, Everyone's amazed at the level of customer service they get. So I think for us, you know, applying all those things, in, including sometimes just dedicating personnel, um, helps a lot. It makes people sort of feel the love they need. If they don't get that one-to-one -one contact, um, they'll look elsewhere. I wanted to quickly mention that Bert took the red eye from L.A. to be here this morning, and we really appreciate the fact that you uh, tried to sleep in the plane. Thanks a lot, Anthony. I had a shower in uh, a bathroom see, at Logan. See, I wasn't going to uh, say that. Yeah. I wasn't going to say that, but you okay. That's right. What am I going to do? We would have had a room for you here, you know? We could have. I got to take it till about 2 o'clock and I'll fall asleep. <laughs> okay, not yet, though. Not yet. Do we have another question? Yes, right over here. Right in the corner. Yes. Good morning. I'm Bruce Howell, and uh, nice timing because my question is for you, Bert, so stay awake. Um, <laughs> Well, I just want to suggest perhaps for your brother, his title could be COO, Chief Other Optimist. But my question is really a follow-on to what you mentioned about your revelation at UNH recently. Um, it seems to me like what you've described at the be beginning of your company, it all began in and around college campuses. And I'm curious now is what you see as your new focus as it relates to what you heard there. Uh, I'm not sure I've followed it. Can you? Well, you mentioned that you spoke at UNH recently and that you recognized that you 